Hi. <laughs> I'm Mother Ann Hutcherson, in case there's somebody out there that's looking in and doesn't know me. And I say good morning to visitors, but I also say a special good morning to, to all of you who are online and attending in pajama mode. <laughs> I know I speak for all of us here um, that we are missing you so very, very much. And we especially miss Father John and Anne. So, on continuing, uh, I thought about following the example of a priest in Canada, and he was tempted to, um, or he actually did do this, he took a pictorial of all of the pictures of the parish members and cut them up and then pasted them all on the pews. And I thought that would be a really great idea, but somehow or another, we didn't get around to that. And um, so now we are on, on camera with our live stream and on camera with our Facebook friends. So welcome. And there is good news. Spring arrived this weekend. And it's only three weeks to Easter. In fact, this fourth Sunday of Lent is called the Latari Sunday to remind us that it's time to take a little break in our solemn Lenten observance and to rejoice. And that seems horribly ironic given the circumstances. Nevertheless, in some churches and even here in Kansas City, the celebrant is wearing pink vestments today in honor of St. Mary, while in England it is called Mothering Sunday. The original intent, of course, was to honor the Mother of God. Today, it's very much like our Mother's Day, though I imagine this year it's quite different with no long brunch lines and with the pubs closed, which is the first time in history they weren't even closed during the World War II. Well, <clears throat> I've avoided what's on our hearts and minds of pretty much every human being on the planet. We try to balance the extremes of anxiety and fear with hilarious memes that lighten the moment. And personally, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, I find humor not only a, an oasis, but also an opportunity to be in touch with others for something other than grim COVID-19 alerts. A parishioner shared one such meme with me on Friday, and I have watched it at least seven times since. I mean, it beats being glued to constant disaster news and updates. Well, I think a more productive activity might be to delve into our Old Testament readings of Lent, where there is absolutely no escaping the truth of our human condition that has had us quite adept at getting ourselves into a lot of trouble for close to almost 3,000 years, I think. And repeatedly, we humans forget who ultimately is in charge. And then when woes overwhelm us, we blame God for not paying attention to our needs or for being absent when we need comfort or worse, we dare to consider God a figment of our imaginations. Genesis certainly brings all that to the fore and the lingering question from last week's Exodus reading is magnified today. Is the Lord among us or not? Let's face it, it's easy to consider God an easy target when we feel abandoned and betrayed. And we probably rarely ask, does God ever get frustrated with us or feel abandoned and betrayed? Well, the situation is no less today. Yet before we hasten to make our dilemmas the center of the stage, let's, let's take a quick look at today's Old Testament example from 1 Samuel. 
It seems perfectly paired with today's gospel, and this is a short version. Briefly, the first king of the Israelites is Saul, an extraordinarily tall and handsome choice, but he was quickly proven to be a failure. Even God was disappointed and ready to explore other options. God also knew that cooperation from Samuel was important because Samuel was a kind of father figure to Saul. So God's suggestion that something needed to change really kind of upset Samuel because of his relationship with him, but also because he knew that if Saul found out he was a part of this scheme, Saul would kill him. Such is true for any prophet who gets stuck between two uncomfortable choices, isn't it? And like most of us, Samuel tried to avoid making a decision. God's patience waned. Samuel reluctantly obeyed, and off he went to Bethlehem, where the choice of the next king would occur. Now, I think I counted correctly here. There were 10 rejected camp candidates, and seven of them were sons of Jesse. And finally, the exasperated Samuel asked Jesse if he has any more sons. Well, yes, he does. There is the very youngest, a shepherd, out in the fields. So the young shepherd is brought in, and lo, he is a handsome, ruddy lad with beautiful eyes, and he charmed them all. That's the one, the Lord whispered to Sam. And in a flash, the next king of Israel was anointed. And his name? David. See how history is kind of shaping up here? Of course, history also provided that David was as imperfect as any one of the rest of us, and he would suffer both human and divine disapproval. Sounds like a familiar story. I mean, we insist on perfection in our leadership, blind to the inner flaws we all possess. And then we complain, wondering if God knows what God's doing. You know, when times get tough, our memories get short. I mean, we forget all that God has done. I mean, starting off with protecting Moses and his followers from the, the plagues, helping them escape slavery, opening the sea, leading them on over the pillar of cloud and fire. We fail to understand, as we heard today in that reading, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Which, of course, leads us directly into our gospel that tells the story of the blind man who was made to see by Jesus. And we usually tend to think of this event as a, another miracle story, but it's actually far more than a religious phenomenon. It's actually a perfect story to ponder because it challenges us to explain what cannot be explained, to pose questions that challenge our faith, and to come out on the other side with a deeper relationship with God and one another. It seems reasonable to receive this story as the one we are living right now. Different folks, different circumstances, but our wilderness of social distancing in the midst of what is the equivalent to an ancient plague, as well as the accompanying financial disasters, is a story that leaves us anxious and even hopeless, blind, if you will, unable to see what will happen. But perhaps more importantly is what is the re really going to happen is what is happening now. We seek to blame, wonder if the presence of evil is the issue, and I am not here to play expert and discuss the existence of evil or not. 
But I do believe that now is an opportunity for self-reflection and self-assessment. I believe life is more than washing our hands or staying sequestered in our homes with gallons of hand sanitizer. I believe we can use this experience to better learn how God sees things and hopefully keep what we learn in our corporate memory. I'm not suggesting we ignore our spiritual saints or our therapists and mindfulness experts. We can learn a lot from our teachers and medical professionals, our mentors, and hopefully your priests. But I also believe we can learn, learn from and trust the collective knowledge of one another. And as someone who has lived a few years beyond many of you, I have a perspective that remembers her daddy going off to World War II, losing, uh, uh, I was going to skip, to, I went the, the bomb shelter in the basement, that's vivid, the civil rights movement, and losing friends to the AIDS epidemic, and of course, 9-11. I think that there are achievable steps we can take to not only survive, but flourish, recognizing our one God with us, even when we screw up. So first, on my little list, we have the need to take time to remember. And this small picture here, it's a little rabbit. It is a Dure rabbit. It's in the central part of my Lenten array on our mantle. You may wonder why. It was because it was the only thing left of my Aunt Peggy's house in Germany after it was bombed. And she gave it to me as a, an icon of survival, to believe that even though we walk through the darkest valley, God is with us. Kind of reminds me of Father John's challenge last week when he reminded us to persevere and then take the next step and another step. Second, I think it's important to remain alert and grateful. I mean, don't just pass it by. Take a good solid look at the crocus and the daffodils and how they defy storms. Take notice of how your dog or a cat too leans in, teaching you how to love. And practice joy by finding new ways of being together while physically apart like the online coffee hour that Adam and Kim have organized for after this service today. I think really that each day is a gift and it can be a real beginning of an adventure. Of course, adventures sometimes have bumps in the road, but it's important to treasure and be grateful for this moment of adventure, whatever it brings. And finally, you need to listen. Listen to God's word. I've been really working on that this Lent. And I thought about a very insightful two and a half year old member of our church who really shows us how. His name is Alex and his parents walk home after Eucharist on Sunday mornings, currently of course on hiatus. And as each stranger passes by, Alex greets them with these distinct words. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. He sees the body of Christ in every person he encounters. May we do likewise. 
perhaps by looking into someone's eyes instead of away from them, smiling and actually saying, hello. I think we've lost that habit. And yet everyone could be encouraged to be noticed. Finally, it never hurts to listen to a favorite theologian, one of mine, Frederick Beekner, had this to say the other day. When horrors happen, we can't use God to make them unhappen. All we can do is to draw close to God and close to each other as best as we can. And there is nothing that happens, not even hell, where God is not present with us and for us. Maybe through all of this, we can learn to never stop looking for a glimmer of hope.